Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. I'd like to take a few minutes today on the Jesus Changes Everything podcast to speak about my mentor's mentor, my hero's hero. You know, I've been blessed because of my relationship with my father to uh, have had interaction with uh, some of the greatest theologians of the 20th and 21st centuries. I was blessed to study with some of them formally, to be in relationship with some of them, to cross paths with some of them. When I was seven years old, uh, we had a visitor to the old Ligonier Valley Study Center that caught my attention because uh, he was wearing knickers and had this long hair on top of a bald head. And uh, people seemed to be quite struck and focused on him. And I just thought he looked like an elf. Uh, that was Francis Schaefer. Uh, I had an occasion once where I left uh, the exceedingly erudite and proper uh, John Warwick Montgomery uh, in a situation where he was nonplussed, his his plus inventory was completely uh, empty and barren. Uh, there's many, many more, but in fact, many of them were more well known than the gentleman that I'm speaking about today. I don't think that any of them were probably better men of God. My mentor and my hero was, of course, my father. And his mentor and his hero was Dr. John Gerstner. Now, most of you may have this idea that uh, my father emerged from the womb uh, carrying his own set of Calvinist Institutes, but uh, that's not at all the case. In fact, my father did not even come to Christ, though he grew up in the church, a Presbyterian church. He did not come to Christ or even hear the gospel until he was in college. And uh, for some time while in college, he didn't necessarily take a particular perspective uh, on the issues that separated uh, Reformed folks from not Reformed folks. And in God's providence, because he was uh, born and raised in Pittsburgh, he happened to uh, enroll after college at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. Now, Pittsburgh Seminary, uh, it was not Reformed. It was not Arminian. It was profoundly liberal. And by liberal, I mean professors who denied the resurrection of Jesus. Virtually none of the professors affirming uh, the inerrancy of Scripture. Uh, people just being hostile, professors being hostile to Orthodox Christianity. My father tells the story of uh, the day he preached in chapel at Pittsburgh Seminary as a student. He had been chosen for uh, that privilege, and he preached on the death of Christ for us. He preached on substitutionary atonement. And when uh, his sermon was finished, the faculty was lined up uh, to speak to him, not to thank him, but to rebuke him for speaking such barbaric uh, uh, theology to the students of the seminary. Well, one of the reasons my father was able to escape Pittsburgh Seminary uh, without embracing any of that theological uh, liberalism is that there was one professor on the faculty who was decidedly biblical and faithful, and that was John Gerstner. In fact, Gerstner was put on the faculty when Pittsburgh Seminary uh, 
merged with Xenia Presbytery, which was a Presby- uh, Presbyterian seminary. Xenia was much uh, smaller, uh, but in the merger negotiations, Dr. Gerstner was given uh, tenure at the new or at the combined schools. And so he was secure there. They couldn't get rid of him. And there he taught and there he developed a uh, cadre of faithful men. There's a long list of men uh, who've had an ongoing profound influence uh, on the church that studied directly under uh, John Gerstner. One of those was uh, my former boss, uh, Robert Ingram. Uh, another one was a fellow who served as professor at Bellhaven College for decades, uh, Wynne Kenyon. Another was uh, the PCA's chief parliamentarian and a great man of God, uh, Dave Coffin. That's just a few off the top of my head who studied with Dr. Gerstner. And my dad, again, was another one. And when he got to Pittsburgh Seminary, uh, he quickly got to the place where he realized, okay, well, the Bible seems to teach uh, the sovereignty of God and over all things, and I have a duty to believe it, but I don't have to like it. Well, eventually he came not only to like it, but to love it. And he came to understand it and he came to defend it because he sat at the feet of Dr. John Gerstner. Now, Dr. Gerstner, while teaching at uh, Pittsburgh Seminary, lived in Ligonier, Pennsylvania, uh, just down the road from the Ligonier Valley Study Center. And he, his home church was the church that I grew up in, Pioneer Presbyterian Church. Uh, and uh, that meant that I got to interact with him as a boy. And then in God's providence... When I went away to high school, I don't know if you remember me ever talking about that, but uh, my parents made the decision that for the sake of my education, I needed to not go to the local uh, government school, but rather uh, go to a private school. And they sent me to a school in Wichita, Kansas. Well, in God's good providence, the local church there uh, brought Dr. Gerstner in after he retired from Pittsburgh Seminary to be a sort of teacher in residence. And that was the church that I attended. So I actually got to listen to Dr. Gerstner twice every Sunday when I was in high school. I didn't go to the high school Sunday school. I did go to the eight o'clock service for church. Because they had church and church only at 8 o'clock. They had church and Sunday school at 9.30, church and Sunday school at 11. And so at 9.30 and 11, I was in Sunday school class listening to Dr. Gerstner. Afterwards, the fellow who had founded the school that I attended, Mr. Bob Love, who was one of our early heroes you never heard of and who my first book was dedicated to, uh, used to take us all to uh, the country club for brunch. And Dr. Gerstner and he would, and his wife Lil would uh, engage in significant conversation. And I got to sit and listen to that. So I got to know Dr. Gerstner even more in that context. And then once I was in seminary, I had the privilege of having him for a couple of classes during the January term and working as a TA for him and working as an editor for him. And I just loved him. He scared me. He was such a godly man that I felt like, oh, he's going to see right through me. He's going to know that I'm not anywhere near as pious as he is. But gosh, I just respect him. I admire him. I look up to him. I want to be like him. And I tried to be a blessing to him. In fact, one of the ways I became an editor to him is that he agreed to allow a small publisher to publish one of his books. And somehow uh, that book was kind of a mess in terms of editorial work, sentences stopping in mid-sentence, just weird things like that. And I said, Dr. Gerstner, the next time you want to publish a book, uh, would you be willing to allow me to uh, at least give it a run through or just a quick copy at it uh, before you send it or they send it off to the printer? And he said, of course. And uh, a year later, he sent me 
volume one of his magnum opus, The Rational Biblical Theology of Jonathan Edwards, and he asked me to send it back the next day. I was up all night uh, proofreading. Uh, thankfully, there weren't nearly as many mistakes because it had already been through the hands of uh, Dave Coffin, that same PCA parliamentarian uh, who did an excellent job. So, Dr. Gerstner, and this is hard to explain for people who weren't a part of that culture or that time, but he was such a godly man and such a titanic intellect, so rational, so biblical that it, it kept, it, it made room for Orthodox people to not be embarrassed. He, he, he was like, a champion for us. And he, you know, gave that gift and that calling to my father. I'll put it this way. I, I, I don't want to denigrate the import or the impact of uh, lots of great men who uh, taught uh, biblical theology, whether it's John, James Montgomery Boyce or whether it's uh, J.I. Packer or whether it's who, this guy or that guy. Uh, but for whatever extent my father was engaged in that work, which made the Reformed faith more uh, widespread and significant, he did that because Dr. Gerstner equipped him so that he could do that. If you want to chase that lineage down, there's Dr. Gerstner, who very few people have heard of. Now, Dr. Gerstner is not as great a writer as my father was, but he could write accessibly. So I'm going to encourage you, uh, if you haven't, to check out either some lectures of his. That Ligonier still carries a, a number of wonderful series that he did, um, or also any of his books. In fact, in our next segment, uh, we're going to talk about one of those books. I just wanted to talk about Dr. Gerstner first. I feel better already. Dr. Gerstner has gone home to be with the Lord. He did so oh, 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, he was just a wonderful man of God. And perhaps someday I'll tell you some more stories about Dr. Gerstner. I have done the research to find out that, in fact, the book I'm covering today is no longer in print. Uh, I nevertheless feel comfortable recommending it to you because, despite it's not being in print, it is available uh, from used booksellers at a very reasonable price. It's not one of these that you uh, plug it into Amazon, and if you want it, you're going to have to pay $200 for it. Not at all. In our previous segment, I spent uh, some time speaking well of Dr. John Gerstner, and I mentioned that the book that I want to cover is one of his. And in fact, it was the last book that Dr. Gerstner uh, wrote prior to his death in 1996. Uh, it was published by Soli Deo Gloria Publishers, which is no longer uh, in business. Uh, that's, pr I guess, why it's no longer uh, available. But the book is called Theology in Dialogue, and it is just the kind of thing that Dr. Gerstner would do. Uh, it's not enough that Dr. Gerstner should take it upon himself to write a systematic theology. In fact, one could argue that this is his second systematic theology, and I'll get to that in a moment. But he not only writes a systematic theology, but he determined to write it in the form of a dialogue. Now, that particular format can certainly be overused, but it can also be used very, very well, uh, despite the fact that I have foundational uh, and deep disagreements with Dr. Peter Kreeft, uh, who's a professor at uh, either Boston College or Boston University, I can never remember, uh, but who's written a number of wonderful books, uh, at least one of which I'm sure I've covered in the Curating Your Book Library segment, in the form of dialogues, uh, The Unaborted Socrates, Between Heaven and Hell, and um, the good thing, best things in life, rather. Well, here Gerstner is giving a systematic theology, not just in the context of a dialogue, but a dialogue between an inquirer and a Christian. 
So on the one hand, you have a believer. On the other hand, you have the unbeliever. And you have this conversation going back and forth. Now, of course, we know that the book is being written by the believer, that the unbeliever is, in a manner of speaking, Dr. Gerstner's sock puppet. But Dr. Gerstner is a uh, uh, profoundly uh, insightful and wise and clear-thinking man uh, who is diligent to put the best, best face forward uh, for his sort of uh, faux opponent here in this book. I really want to encourage you to pick it up, find it, track it down, and read it because it's a great way, again, to be introduced to Dr. Gerstner, to uh, get a systematic theology done uh, quickly and uh, understandably, um, but also to maybe teach you a thing or two about uh, reasoning and logic and argumentation. Dr. Gerstner uh, scared me because of his piety, and uh, it was also a scary thing to be engaged in debate with him because he was so sharp, and he would not let anything get by, and he, he, he was able to zero in on uh, the flaw in your argument very, very quickly. And because of that, uh, I, I think a lot of people missed his fundamental humility and his deep, deep uh, uh, compassion and concern uh, for other people. He, he, he didn't go into an argument uh, with the goal of manifesting his own uh, giant intellect. He really did go in to try to help people uh, come to understand uh, the truth. And by the way, it's also uh, his habit, was regularly his habit, uh, to sort of take the bad side of the argument and try to argue it through. My father tells the story, uh, it's a great story, uh, of Dr. Gerstner pretending to be a Mormon and taking the position that God has a body. And he was asking his class uh, to counter that argument. And this one tried this argument and Dr. Gerstner demolished it. And this one tried that argument. Dr. Gerstner demolished it. And uh, they get all the way uh, or close to the end of the class. And then finally they come up to my, my dad and he says, well, this probably isn't the answer, but uh, Jesus did say to the woman at the well in John that God is a spirit. So, and Dr. Gertrude said, no, 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 that won't do at all. And moved on to the next student. And when they were finally finished with the whole class, the students were like, Dr. Gerstner, you got to rescue us. We don't want to become Mormons. What's the right answer? And Dr. Gerstner said, well, the Bible says in John's gospel, uh, when Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well, that God is spirit. And my dad was like, that's what I said. And Dr. Gerstner said, and what did I say? I said, no, 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 that won't do at all. What kind of argument is that? <laughs> How could you let me get away with that? Ah. Uh, Great, great story. I actually also, uh, if you're more of an audio or video person than a book person, and let me make another commendation to you. Uh, years ago, I plotted out and, and sort of, uh, well, planned uh, a video series called Silencing the Devil in which we had a mock debate between my father and Dr. Gerstner. Uh, it turned out really well, so I'd encourage you to check that out as well. And there's a lot to be said for these conversations, for discussion back and forth. That's why we say education is conversation. It's why I say send us a message. Give us some feedback. Give us some comments. Send us an email. You can do that as always at hello, rcjr at gmail.com. Hello, rcjr at gmail.com. Or wherever you're listening to this, there's probably a place to make comments right underneath it. So I would love to hear from you. If you've read this book, again, it's a little obscure, but it's really uh, accessible and good and helpful. I'd love to get your thoughts uh, on Dr. Gerstner and specifically uh, if you have them thoughts on theology in dialogue. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe 
which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsportjr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.